Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox and thanks for logging on. This is Watches Tonight. This evening we are talking about Omega watches you can buy for $10,000 or less. Quality is still available for accessible prices. We're talking about your watches, your questions for me and viewer wrist shots will be seen tonight on Watches Tonight. Jump into the box real quick. We have Edward Ledden of Sweden, Soma R of Budapest tonight, Chris Fernandez from Miami, Joe Tyson from Apex, North Carolina, and Eric Nielsen from Asheville, North Carolina, Butik One from Poland, Amik in Florida, Arto Charles, Joe Pinto from Louisville, Time Hill, BJ, Sincan joining from London, and Mark S, a relatively local boy up by 95 in Brooklyn. Okay, so guys, check out the redesigned homepage of thewatchbox.com. And I know it's redesigned because they told me to update the graphic I was using to depict the website on this show. So even I was taken about by our number of updates and the speed that the website is growing. And it's mostly watches, not just graphics. So check out all the updates on an hourly basis as we add our real-time inventory. 3,000 pre-owned watches or more on thewatchbox.com. Okay, Instagram. It is my other home these days. I started on YouTube, but I now have a presence on Instagram and YouTube. Shorter videos on Instagram, one minute reviews, the best pieces. Whereas on YouTube, I tend to focus more on volume and all pieces. I save the very finest for my Instagram account. You can digest them one minute a piece. 2,500 posts corresponding to roughly 2,500 minutes of continuous watch reviews. So check me out, Tim underscore Masso on Instagram. Rick on Watches is in the box, keeping a watch UK from the UK and Ascot. We've got Miguel joining from Albuquerque. We've got Miroslav joining in. And we've got Zaffer from Switzerland, Kia from Irvine, California, Time Hill, Thomas Burnett, Dan CT. Guys, welcome aboard. Time Hill saying, Tim's Instagram videos are great. I'm much obliged. And thanks for those views, guys. So let's jump straight into wrist shots, some of yours on mine. We start with Del V, who hits the road with his Rolex Daytona and his Mercedes-Benz GLS 63 AMG. That is a power pairing. Robert A from Long Island, my old neck of the woods, impresses with his rose gold, or I should say ever rose, Oyster Flex Daytona and Porsche. Love the custom cuffs. We've got Dan A. of Zurich, who stuns with his vintage Ulysse Norden Astrolabium Galileo Galilee, which you can incidentally see on my Instagram because we met in Switzerland. Denio M. reports from my beloved Miami Beach with his Audemars Piguet Royal Oak 50th Anniversary Edition, a lovely photo, maybe our best of the night. Jeff R. of Texas finally takes delivery of his awaited white gold meteorite dial full bracelet Rolex Daytona. We've got another custom cuff. Congratulations on your new watch, Jeff. Wear it in the best of health. Jerry Adams joining in from Colorado. We've got John claude Beaver. We've got Eric R. from Utah. We've got Time Hill, Aaron S. from Boca Raton. And Aaron is saying that Ulysse is awesome. Indeed it is. It's the earliest version of the Astrolabium. It was very cool to see. Mike K. saying, hi Tim, I used to be a watch snob, then I saw the light. I like the Zin 556A. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, I'm a sort of a Zin for life type guy. I bought them for all my family and friends. I had one until it went away for a cause that was sufficient for me to let it go. Uh, but I'm a big fan. There are several different versions of the 556, so find the one you like best. It's a great watch at a great price, and I have always felt that Zin offers true value. What else is going on? Watches with Dennis. Hello from Kansas. Hello, Dennis. Welcome. Okay, $10,000 Omega watches, new and used. Omega had a fantastic year of new model releases, the chrono chime being the most extreme, but one of many fantastic novelties for the second largest of the Swiss Luxury 3. But its back catalog of previous models is even better. So let's set a hard stop at 10,000 US dollars and explore my favorite Omega watch options that fit within our price point. So, first, we need to talk about a sentimental favorite of mine. I haven't mentioned it too often on this show, but 
the DeVille Chronoscope Retropomp. This is a watch that is really a high horology split second chronograph launched back in 2005. This was uncharted territory for Omega, which had never offered a chronograph with this level of complication, high horology base movement and intricacy. Now here's the great thing. Omega was truly stepping into unoccupied upmarket territory, at least by the standards of the big three of Omega, and Rolex and Breitling. None of them had ever built anything like this and Rolex certainly wouldn't dare follow into the realm of split second chronographs. It was powered by a caliber 3612 derived from a Blanc Pan Frédéric Piguet a 1286 Bausch. So this is a thicker, tougher, more robust version of the celebrated 1180 chronographs. And this was a level of finishing, if not haute horlogerie, certainly to a much higher level than any Omega that wasn't one of the specialty shop tourbillon or skeleton watches of the 90s. This was a very special watch. Think about what you got in this movement. Automatic winding two column wheels, a vertical clutch, a, a free-sprung balance, COSC certified, coaxial escapement, hacking seconds, quick set date, and an above average 52 hour power reserve. All of this, and though the watch looks much like a dress piece, it's still 100 meters water resistant, so there's a lot of versatility here, and will not commonly seen, if you wanted, there was a bracelet option. So 41 millimeters, it's even smaller than it looks in the photos. The photos look like they might be 42, 43, even 44, but it's a 41, and even I can wear it. It had everything, including decent loom. It truly had one foot in the world of the sports watch and one foot in the world of the dress watch. It's what can be called an all-arounder. It's a watch that can do everything. There was even an only watch version of it in 2005 with a Guilloche ruthenium dial and a platinum case. I wonder where that watch is today, but given that I work at Watchbox, I'll probably find out sooner or later. And there was a lovely satin version that was finished in brushed steel, which was a great subdued look to go along with a non guilloche ruthenium dial option. And that was a great kind of low profile look for the guy who liked the watch, but with the strength of the dial and the fluted lugs and the stepped case, maybe high polish was a bit too much. Omega had you covered there too. High grade cut dial, you could see that it featured applique indices and lovely delta style hands. It was a very, very special watch. Many dial options were offered. This one always gets me, but then Mother of Pearl was also available on a very niche model, so there was variety. The DeVille split I want most was the Inverse Panda, that one that you see right there. A fantastic looking watch, but back in the 2000s, it was price prohibitive. Consider that even today, the Rolex Daytona has just rolled over to a $14,000 price point. Back in 2005, this thing cost $14,000. The good news is, even with its Blanc Pan bloodlines and complications, Prices you'll pay today are reasonable. You'll pay generally between six and eight thousand dollars to get a good example with box and papers and hopefully if you shop around recent service paperwork. All worth your while because this is a fantastic watch. The likes of which could easily go toe to toe not so much with Breitling, not so much with Rolex, but with the likes of Jeger Lecoult, Zenith, even Vacheron Patek or AP, a very special timepiece. It's really a blanc pan for Omega Money and used Omega Money at that. Let's go see what's going on in the box right here. We've got Lux Report, Sean Hansen, we've got Miroslav, we've got Scott Wexland from Westchester, Pennsylvania, we've got Mike K saying, Hi Tim, I'm getting into small, affordable independence. Would you be open to having a show to discuss small, affordable, independent watchmakers? Sure, but let me know, what do you define as affordable? Because to me, affordable is like Nomos and an Ordain. Substantially less than four figures, I'm not sure. Maybe though, so let me know. What else is going on? Gear and train, Simon Holtz, and I have my new Tudor GMT diet root beer on tonight. Just got it and absolutely loving it. Usually a Zin chap, but the Tudors are building up. Congratulations, Simon, wear it in good health. I always like to hear about a new watch arrival. And then we have Norm M, hey Tim, why all the kerfluffle about Rolex entering the pre-owned market? Haven't been companies doing it for years in the car space. 
And no, it's not the gray market. That's true. A lot of people call the pre-owned market the gray market, but it's different. Pre-owned is a straightforwardly used watch that had an end user and was then sold to someone else. Whereas the gray market is a watch that didn't sell at a dealer, gets sold to a secondary market non-authorized dealer and then gets sold to a user. And it's the watch that's never owned by an end user but sold by an unauthorized dealer that is gray market. And of course, black market is counterfeit, stolen, and Franken watches. And then Jim Millet saying that Omega is incredible value. And then Mike K is saying his price point for these small independents under three thousand. We'll try to do that. Amit K is saying, Tim, could you do a show on Cartier? I would love to do a show on Cartier. That's a great idea, Amit. I'm going to steal that one from you. Okay, jumping back into our regularly scheduled program. By the way, Sean on the switcher tonight. He's always doing a good job. The second Omega I want to talk about is the Speedmaster Moonwatch Gray Side of the Moon. We're not going to dwell on this too much because I've talked about this watch before. But if you are new to the Omega secondary market, you might be surprised to know that this is a $12,000 new watch that becomes a very accessible pre-owned timepiece. Now it came out in 2014. It was a variant on the prior year's smash hit Dark Side of the Moon. This sells for under nine grand if you want to find one pre-owned and you will see that they are available under nine grand with box papers and original warranty card. So this is a great way to get into a fantastic watch. It has more character and personality than the dark side of the moon. There's more richness in the solid platinum granular dial. It has more loom. Both the crown and the bezel are fully luminescent. They are not on the dark side. It's 44.25 millimeters, but all in sapphire and ceramic. It's feather light. And again, all in sapphire and ceramic. It does not want to scratch. So if you have qualms about buying pre-owned watches because you think they might be marked or refinished, you know that's not a thing with these. Also, it's less stark than the dark side, which makes it a better everyday watch. Furthermore, it's got lovely little details, like for example, the pin buckle. Both the buckle and the pin are made from the same gray ceramic as the case. So unlike, say, an Hublot with a ceramic case, the whole watch is scratch-resistant ceramic, and it's always the buckle of your watch that gets ground and scratched on your desk, so it's nice to have that feature. There's lots to love. The caliber is top of the line. It's the coax tri-level chronometer, twin barrel, 60 hours power reserve, mobile time zone jumping hour hand, vertical clutch, column wheel, shock resistant, amagnetic, and a very good looking piece for a machine finished movement. Of course, an Omega exclusive. Designed by ETA, but an Omega exclusive. A very cool watch for under nine grand. Just so much to love, and don't be put off by the 44.25 millimeter case size. I can wear this watch, and so can you. Remember, my wrist is 16 centimeters. Okay, now a watch that a lot of long-term viewers will recognize, the DeVille Hour Vision Annual Calendar. Formally, this came out in 2008. It was the second model in the still new Hour Vision series. And if we can go to full screen there, you can see that it was called the Hour Vision because there were sapphire viewports at all four corners of the case. So you could see the movement, which was an all new movement for the company at the time. Now at 41 millimeters, it was sizable, but neither big nor small. 100 meters water resistant, surprising for a dress style. And then it had caliber 8611, which was neat because in this version, in the launch version of the annual calendar, it was actually equipped with a solid gold rotor and a solid gold balance bridge. You've got sapphire windows for vision, a very upscale multi-level applique index metal plated dial, and it's even better in steel with the latest master chronometer, caliber 8902. You can see that would probably be the way I would take mine. A very cool piece with lots of warmth in the combination of the blue dial, the blue strap, and a few well-chosen applique elements on the dial. You can get creative and change the character entirely with an Omega factory strap, and that's very similar to the color scheme I've got on my Dan Reuter uh, DR02 that I'm wearing right now. It's a big success for me. I love a dark blue and a bright green and it matches the dial perfectly. MSRP on this watch is $11,200 but we know better on the pre-owned market and it's an annual calendar which is a fun upscale complication Patek Philippe invented in 1996. 
So you get a little bit of high horology cool with this Omega timepiece. And it's just as shock resistant and anti-magnetic as any Omega Master chronometer. Definitely recommended, especially when you can get them for under 8,000 bucks. All right, jumping into the box here, Time Hill saying the Hour Vision annual calendar is also fantastic. Mark S saying those lugs look like the JLC chrono lugs that function as pushers. And Dan CT saying, oof, that DeVille in blue is tasty. Adriano 17, Tim, do you like the new Omega 60th Bond? Yes, but I don't love it. I think you have to love a watch to pay thousands of dollars. Fortunately, we've got a Bond Omega in this episode that I do happen to love, and I'm going to share that with you. But viewer wrist shots number two are in order. Let's take a look at Alex, who joins us from behind the wheel with his IWC Pilot's Watch Mark 12, JLC powered, and his BMW M240i. We love our watches and wheels shots. Jesse R and his vintage Seiko Bellmatic wrist alarm join our evening proceedings. We love our vintage Seikos. Mario S joins us from Seaside in Germany with his IWC Pilot's Watch chronograph. And Mario, it looks awesome against the seashore. Note how he's partially cuffed the chrono, a classic koi dress shot. Taking a look at Thomas B. and Lola the Cat, who appreciate his Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter on a perfectly fitting white rubber B strap. Dylan L. and his Rolex Air King probably should cook that first. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces on these pixels. All right, what's going on? We've got Max joining in from Vancouver. We got Aaron S saying, love the DR02. I'm in contact with Dan for the next run. That's right, he makes 75 a year. I was lucky to have one. We made 25 more for my Facebook group. We got Watch This joining in from Mexico City. And we've got Thomas Burnett saying, always loved the IWC Pilots watches. We got W U A W 2011, Wu Wow 2011, saying first time comment, long time viewer. Thank you for joining in. And then Edward Ledden and Dylan, always long time viewers. We've got Phil Dupuis saying joining late, but glad to join in from Ottawa, Canada. Well, thank you for joining me from the Great White North. So, Omega depends on the Speedmaster and Seamaster to the same degree that IWC depends on its pilot and Portuguese lines, the twin pillars, the anchors the ones that haul the iron. What is most interesting? Are the Seamasters available new or used for $10,000? And I'm gonna find some that are a little bit off the beaten path. We all know the classic Bond Seamaster, but how often do you see the Seamaster Diver 300 meter Tritone? It's based on the Bond, but it is anything but standard stock. It's more of a Bond villain watch with its combination of red gold, tantalum, and titanium. Launched as a 25th anniversary model within the 2018 collection, this Tritone watch referenced a 1993 Tritone chronograph with three prominent metals, again, titanium, blue-gray tantalum, and Sedna red gold. You can see that the bracelet contains all three and the case and bezel assembly likewise. At 42 millimeters, it's large but not huge and details matter more than size. This is a no-date diver. The standard version of this watch has a date. This one does not and the dial is made of solid titanium. 2,500 were made and each comes with a cool box for display. You can see that the box is as interesting and distinctive as the watch. Caliber 8806 in this 2500 piece limited edition provides able power and the diving clasp is outstanding with both a pull out extension and an incremental push button slider. Omega bracelet quality, especially when made up of three different metals, lives up to its billing. Oddly, this watch can be found for both more and less than its retail price of $13,200. So you're going to have to shop around. For the most part, this is a watch that is priced over $10,000 used, but particularly when you can find a private seller as opposed to a dealer on Chrono24 or eBay, you can work something out at or below $10,000. So this one, which is super cool and rare, just slides in underneath our self-imposed price cap. What else is going on? 
Abdul from Germany joins in, saying the two-tone titanium looks great, and the tritone, I must add, is even better. Jim Miltzing wearing the current model SMP300, perfect daily wearer. And then Nathan W. saying that was the first luxury watch I ever tried on. We'll always have a soft spot for that, but the $13,000 retail price is ridiculous. And let's jump back to our regularly scheduled program because if you don't have $10,000 or $10,000 borderline to spend on your Bond Seamaster, I have good news because there is the Seamaster Diver 300 meter Commander's Watch, which might be my favorite special edition James Bond themed Omega timepiece. Why the hate? I recall the vitriol directed at this 2017 limited edition of 7,007 pieces. And while I can understand the edition number being somewhat farcical, that's not very limited. The watch itself is incredibly appealing. They sweated the details. The seventh numeral on the date disc, and only the seventh numeral, was red. It was a beautiful watch. Retailing for around $5,000, it was one of the last of the 41 millimeter generation. It came with all sorts of toys, including a full bracelet with dive extension in the clasp, and a military-themed boxed set with special literature, an accessory strap, a strap tool, and a handsome brass hinge presentation. It was very attractive. It felt special. It came with a military ribbon color scheme and a polished white ceramic dial with blue indices and hands that gave it real presence, even if the 007 counterweight seconds hand was maybe a little bit hokey. It has military themed imagery as well as UK Union Jack themed colors, which I love. I love my UK patriotism. And I have to ask, why are some Omega Bond editions hated and some are coveted? Who knows? There's no rhyme or reason to what becomes beloved and what becomes reviled. James Bond the literary and cinematic James Bond, was a Royal Navy commander, hence the name of this edition, the Commander's Watch, and the case back was a rare use of a display back on an Omega Seamaster Professional Caliber 2500. It was Bond themed, of course, and the center pivot around the bearing was actually nine millimeters, quite fitting. It was actually pretty good to look at for a machine finished movement, and we don't often get a display case back on the Caliber 2500. Maybe the commanders of the the world have had the last laugh with this one, however. Five years later, almost six, this watch makes our sub $10,000 shopping list, but it's also the only watch on tonight's list that sells for significantly more than its original retail price because it retailed for five grand. And here we can find examples at seven, eight, even 10, 11, and $12,000 with box and paper. So maybe this one was just, I don't know, a stumble out of the gate. It has certainly found its stride. Let's see what's going on. Mark S saying, not a fan of that movement. Well, well, it wasn't designed initially to be seen, so there's no coincidence there. Marcello is saying, as a dedicated Omega supporter, I must decline the suggestion that Rolex is better than Omega. I would also decline that suggestion. I am an Omega supporter myself. And then we have Shamba Basher saying, thank you, Tim, the UK will prevail. I'm still a big fan of Britain. I know it's taken some knocks these days, and maybe these are hard times for the image of the UK, and domestic conditions haven't been the best, but it's still one of the leaders in political thought, technology, economics, uh, historically a great nation, and some of the finest folks in the world. Again, we will overcome, this too will pass. Britain got through the blitz, it will get through this. What else is up? Ron H getting up early in Sydney, Australia. I love to see that. And Abdul from Germany saying, I think the 007 Omega collaboration has been one of their best successes. Well, without a doubt, that's brought them renown like nothing else they've ever paid for in the past. And make no mistake, they've paid. What else is going on here? Viewers chats number three, Alex. Alex of Munich works for Watch Pillar, which makes that wonderful display dome you see in the back. They sent me one and I love it. I use it for my JLC Snowdrop. Here it is featured with Alex's Jacques Hedro. Miguel J blasts off with his Omega Speedmaster Professional Moonwatch Tin Tin with a lovely matching strap. Eric O reports from Maui with his Rolex Datejust 41 in a combination of steel and white gold with green dial. 
Kyle A. walks Hannibal the dog while wearing his Panerai Luminor 8 days on a rubber B strap color-coded to match his jacket. And Jimmy Y. and his Rolex sub witness the send-off tour of Sir Elton John. Speaking of the UK, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your watch on this box. Okay, the constellation has long been a phenomenon in Asia, since 1982 to be precise, with the arrival of the so-called Griffin Claw or Manhattan variant. But until recently, it was considered to be past its prime as an offering in Western markets. No longer. 2015 brought us the Constellation Globemaster, and I really do think this is a great watch because in steel and tungsten, it's a 39mm all-arounder that references the much-loved Pi Pan Constellation dials of the 1950s, the earliest and most celebrated variants. The Pi Pan was ringed by coined tungsten in the case of the modern Globemaster, which, make no mistake, is a Constellation Globemaster. It even referenced the original Connie's observatory chronometer status via a logo with observatory and stars on the case back. So the following year, 2016, brought us the larger 41mm Globemaster annual calendar that remains just as versatile. And you can see it as a lovely ruthenium brushed pie pan dial with blue hands, blue indices, and matching blue print. It is a very tidy look. And the dark ruthenium is just superb, giving it a darkness and intensity alongside the near blue hue of the tungsten bezel. Now both versions, the Globemaster and the annual calendar, are loomed automatic in steel with tungsten bezels when the case is steel. They have 100 meter water resistance, they're automatic winding, and these are not frail dress watches, being highly shock resistant and effectively amagnetic to over 15,000 gauss. The entire line was master chronometer or METAS certified from the very beginning, possibly to its detriment. There was a lot of excitement surrounding these watches when they bowed, particularly the Globemaster in 2015, but because of the slow operational um, inauguration and commissioning of the master chronometer factory to make these movements. The watches arrived about a year late, so much of the initial goodwill surrounding the launch of these models was squandered and they were already forgotten by the time Omega was ready to produce these master chronometer movements in series. Unfortunate, but Omega's misfortune is your gain. I feel as though these are overlooked, almost like the Portofino at IWC and the Cellinis at Rolex. No matter how many times I recommend the Globemaster, people are still going to go out, consider the Globemaster, and then wind up putting their money down for a Speedmaster or a Seamaster. You know it's going to happen. But if you're that guy with the independent spirit, you can get both of these Globemasters now for under 10 grand, and there's no reason to buy pre-owned if you don't want to, because each one retails for under 10K. The Globemaster annual calendar is $8,600 on a strap, brand new, in steel, and $6,900 buys you the Constellation Globemaster in steel on a strap. Yes, there is a bracelet available if you want to make it a little bit more of a sports watch, but I would rather wear it on some sort of a textile strap and keep that lovely light look. It's, it's a wonderful balanced watch on the strap. It becomes a little bit brutal on the bracelet. And remember, if you really want to raise the durability factor, the bracelet's only $300 more, so it might be worth considering. Okay. 2004, Omega launched the Constellation Double Eagle Chronograph. What was the Double Eagle? Well, despite the golf nomenclature, it was not designed to be worn while playing golf. No, it wasn't braced for that. But at 41 millimeters in steel with an integrated bracelet, dial loom, a tachymeter dial, and a 100 meter water rating, this amounted to a charm offensive for Western watch buyers who were not enamored of the Constellation, but do love their luxury sports watches. Since 1982, the so-called Griffin Claw at 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock has been what the Connie generally has brought to market, and this is also known as the Manhattan style. And while it is a phenomenon in East Asia, it never found acceptance in the West like that enjoyed in East Asia. By changing the Manhattan into a modern format sports watch, Omega hoped to challenge the state of affairs. The full strap integration with a black lacquered bezel, and it was a lacquered bezel, absolutely sizzling hot. That's probably how I would choose to wear my double eagle chrono. Omega caliber 13 or 3313 was used, another Frederic Piguet derivative, and has most of the features that you saw on the Retropont, including the beauty, but minus the second column wheel. 
And for high sporting style on a budget today, this nearly forgotten watch is available all day long under four grand box and papers, even with the bracelet. Worth considering. And by the way, the full integrated bracelet sports watch stick there was a little bit ahead of its time. Now, viewer is shots number four, Muhammad E, a his and hers, as he and his daughter celebrate her high school graduation in the Dubai Mall. We have Rolex and Seiko, I believe. Anthony T of Las Vegas showcases his Chopard Mille Milia racing chronograph, looking good. You know, we love purple. Lawrence A shares his timeless lacquered bezel platinum Cartier Santos Dumont, the epitome of elegance. And Andrew K. of Britain captures a semi-cuffed Omega Seamaster Planet Ocean, well done, Oran and his Brigade Classique visit Petit Trianon, a chateau on the Versailles complex. Send your shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com and give me your Instagram handle if you have one so I can tag you there. Okay. More Omega for under $10,000. We're going to talk vintage now. Omega has a long history of high-end quartz dating back to its legendary marine chronometer series of the 70s. Fortunately, almost all Omega quartz watches ever made, in spite of their high-tech and spec, are available for $10,000 or less. So let's look back to the 1976 to roughly 1980 Omega Marine Chronometer. This was literally a navigation caliber clock for your wrist, proudly bearing its chronometer certificate corresponding serial number in a gold plaque on the case. This was caliber 1511, a series of 1,000 pieces that went to the French Observatory in Besançon for a 63-day chronometer test that ultimately validated each watch accurate to two thousandths of a second per day. Recall that even Grand Seiko's legendary thermocompensated 9F quartz movements are generally only accurate to two hundredths of a second per day and that decimal placing is a really big deal because with this Omega Marine chronometer all else equal as timed you're talking less than a second gained per year by this wrist borne entirely self-contained marine chronometer. As of 2022, the Omega Marine chronometers remain among the most accurate non-radio watches ever devised. If you want a more accurate wrist-borne quartz watch, even in the era of absolutely bonkers citizen quartz calibers, you're going to need some sort of atomic clock or radio clock to keep up with this thing. And the cases are 32.5 millimeters wide and 48 millimeters lug to lug, but they do wear a little bit larger than that on their integrated bracelets. This is one of those watches where you want to try before you buy because the fit is like a large reverso. Prices, however, are reasonable for the quality obtained and the vintage status of the watch, to say nothing of their rarity. The related caliber 1516 was made in quantities seven times greater than the 1000 piece 1511, which is why there's an apparent price delta. If we can go back to the watches on Chrono 24 that we just saw, the watches that are for sale, you could see that there is sort of a price split right here, and the more expensive ones generally are the caliber 1511s. 1,000 pieces of those, roughly 7,000 of the 1516, but they are equally accurate, so you can take pride in either one. Both of them are extraordinary watches. Now, we jump to 1998, fast forward to the 90s, and we're talking about going to the moon and then beyond, because Mars was on our radar back then. Mars is on our radar now. But back then it seemed inevitable, which is why Omega and NASA joined forces to develop the follow-on to the famous Speedmaster Professional Moon Watch called the Mars Watch in development. The watch was ultimately known as the Speedmaster Professional X33 in production from 1998 to 2006. Probably the best value in Omega Pilots watches and certainly the most capable. Originally billed as the Mars watch, it hasn't made it there yet, but don't give up. We're still thinking about the Red Planet. It was made for civilian consumption from 1998 to 06. Uh, there were two versions in titanium, both 
42.25 millimeters in diameter. They made them for military customers through about 2009. Now it has a 70 decibel alarm that'll wake you up even when you're wearing earplugs, but it had a lot more. It had mission elapsed time. It had a mission elapsed time alarm. It had dual format 12 and 24 hour. It had analog digital. It had universal time and a universal time alarm, a GMT second time zone, a chronograph, a calendar, and a countdown alarm. All of that with a blinding backlight. This thing was stacked. It had the dual display capability, so if you like your analog digital, you get that. It also featured conventional Luminova hands and a timing bezel, along with a now legendary black light. You gotta take your NVGs off or this thing will absolutely cost you your sight when you're looking at it at night. That's how bright the backlight is. And these are collectible without being expensive. As pre-owned, you're gonna pay between $2,500 and $3,000, even box and papers, even with recent service, even on the factory bracelet. So you will have options. Guys, remember, Reach out to tmasso at thewatchbox.com for questions you have about any watches on the watchbox. And let me know in the comments, what sub $10,000 Omega watches would you buy if it were your money? And what topics would you like to see for future episodes of this show? Thanks again to Sean for doing great work behind the switcher. And thanks to you for making the best job in the world possible. Time out, Tim out. And thanks for logging on.